Welcome to church, everybody. You glad to be in church today, anybody? Yeah, glad to be in church? Yeah? Awesome. Well, welcome. I'm very glad you joined us this weekend, and it is baptism weekend, as you heard, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but I do want to just say how glad Susie and I are to be back. We have been on sabbatical the past few weeks, an extended time of, of rest and reconnection and renewal, and it has been very rich for our family, and I want to share with you, I'm not, I'm not a great photographer, but I do want to share with you some of the highlights of our time, so many of you know we have a son uh, named Connor, who's 19, Connor has autism, and we've been planning for this, and during our sabbatical, we moved him into his very own apartment in the basement of our home. Here he is cooking his own dinner. How many know that's not just a good day for Connor, that's a good day for mom and dad right there. <laughs> that's a... And uh, then we, uh, Susie and I, just spent some time together. Here we are getting ready to go uh, on a little cruise in Alaska. I just got to date my wife, and we fell in love all over again, and I got, I just, I have all the tingles, so there you go. So we <laughs> went and saw Alaska for the first time, so ate the world's largest uh, crab legs. You can see there we are in Alaska. And then uh, my daughter, uh, Madeline, she, uh, I was asking her, you know, what's one thing you want to do together um, when we get home while I'm still on sabbatical? She said, I want a Saturday where you bake with me all day. So we baked all day. And I know most of you are used to me as someone who, who climbs mountains and kills large wild animals with my bare hands, but I baked all day long, and this is just one of the delectable things. You, some of you know my daughter. She's like, no pictures of me, but you can show pictures of, of the baked goods, and uh, we just had a great time. And I want to take a moment and just say a massive thank you. I want to say thank you to uh, our board that made this possible, our amazing staff here, the team that I work with every day, and especially to all of you who lead J groups, you lead on the J team, you serve on the J team week after week, really our church family, you didn't miss a beat this summer, and I'm so proud of you, so I wonder, would you just, would you give our J team just a big round of applause, all <laughs> applaud yourselves, and I know you're very modest, but just, uh, I am so proud of you, and, and so grateful for you, thank you from the bottom of my heart, and on behalf of my family for this time uh, that we had, and I've come back just so fired up and just ready for what God has next for our church in the years to come, and I have some things I really feel like God revealed to me very slowly but surely over the past few weeks that I want to share with you in the weeks and months to come in our series together, so you're going to want to come back for all of that. I just, I think we're just about to go uh, to just a new place with God in this season, and wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I want you to be I want you to be a part of it. I want to help you take your next step toward what God has for you. And part of that as well, some stuff coming up the rest of the summer. I'm very excited about Rise Summer Camp is coming this weekend. Yeah, all our middle and high school students are going to be leveling up spiritually in Maryland. So be praying for that. For all of you who are serving at Rise, thank you for investing in the next generation. Our week of prayer is coming up. Uh, two weeks from now, it's going to start, and if you are new to our church, we have two seasons a year that we focus uh, on praying together as a church family, 21 days of prayer and fasting every January, and then in August, this will run Monday through Friday evening, we'll be uh, connecting together for prayer, so make sure now, a couple of weeks in advance, you kind of rearrange your calendar, be here for that, it's going to be a very powerful time, and then as you heard, of course, this is baptism weekend, which means all weekend long, all of our locations, people are going public with their faith in Jesus. And if you're here for the first time, not sure what you believe about God yet, this really is a very meaningful experience for you know, all of us who have uh, taken the step to surrender our lives to Jesus. This is the next step. Whether we've, whether we've trusted Jesus with our lives two minutes ago, two weeks ago, two years ago, whatever it was, baptism is a step that he not only invites us to take, but instructs us to take. It is a public declaration that he is Lord of our lives and really reveals, reminds us and reveals to, to uh, the world around us who we are and whose we are. It's really what baptism is all about. And if you want to take that step today, we have everything ready uh, for you. We'd love uh, to celebrate that with you. I know many of you signed up in advance, but whether you did or not, um, today can be your day. And we are also, as we get ready to celebrate baptism, this is kind of like a prelude this weekend to a series that we're going to be doing throughout the month of August called Kingdom Culture. And here's the big idea 
behind the series that wherever we land when it comes to spiritual things, I think we can all agree that the world we live in is not getting less confusing. It's getting more and more chaotic the way uh, people choose and champion their values and their ideals and what side they're on and what matters to them. It's getting more and more uh, chaotic and there's always a side to be on. There's always an issue to be very intensely passionate or angry about or whatever the case may be. And many of them really are very important issues. And yet what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks is this, this startling thing about Jesus, that when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago and set the stage for what we now experience as his followers, the world he was in was similar in some ways. There was a lot of political oppression, especially where he was in Judea, uh, modern-day Israel. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of political oppression. There was a lot of injustice. There was a lot of racism. There, was, there were a lot of parties who had different ideologies. There was a lot going on in the world that was not right. And that was, was confusing. And yet Jesus, in this kind of startling thing, talked about that, honestly, very little. Surprisingly little. Instead, what he spoke often about was a kingdom that he said was above all else, worth pursuing above all else. This reign and rule of God. And he talked often about the king who rules this kingdom who is above all others. And he talked about this priority of having the right king in our lives. And you may not be sure how much you buy into that yet, or you may still be trying to figure out what you believe about God, and that's okay. I'm very glad you're here. I'm not here to twist your arm. But I think something we can all agree on is whatever side you think you're on, whether politically, socially, whatever it may be, whatever ideals are important to you, whatever values you would say, you hold, have you ever just struggled in your own life, be honest, to figure out what matters most? How many of us have just, have found ourselves, let me put it this way, how many of us have a lot of things that matter? Okay, how many of us, nothing matters, another series for another time, just, <laughs> but how many, how many of us would say, I am not at a loss for things to be concerned about, or to be focused on, or to worry about, or to put my, my uh, emphasis on, and I'm, I'm there many times in my life, I just always have a lot of things that matter, and I find myself asking, but what matters most? It's a really important question if you want to live a healthy and fulfilling life. So in the New Testament of the Bible, there's a letter written by a guy named Paul to a church in the city of Philippi. It's called Philippians. Uh, in this little letter, which Paul wrote toward the end of his life, there's a lot of joy, a lot of encouragement, but there's also a warning not to tie to the Philippians, not to tie their confidence and their identity to this world, to their own achievements, their own influence, even their own religion and efforts to be a good person. Paul says, don't, don't tie your confidence to any of those things, but, but anchor your confidence in Jesus. And Paul, even in Philippians, he lists out some of the things that he personally could put his confidence in. He does this a couple of places in the New Testament where he says, you know, these are the things that I once looked to to validate me as a human being. My ethnicity. He was proud of his ethnicity. He was a Jewish man. He was very proud of that. He was, he was proud at one time in his life of his morality. He had lived a moral life. He had, he had kept the Ten Commandments, and that was important in his, in his time, his Jewish faith. He was proud of his reputation. He was proud of his political party. He names the political party that he was associated with, and it was the, the, like, the most kind of of, of in-tune political party to a lot of people in Paul's world. It's like, these people get it right. Like, they've got the, the same values as me. And he says, I used to think that's what mattered most. His connections, his passion, his work ethic, his resume. These are all things that there was a time in Paul's life he looked at that, those things and said, that's where I find affirmation. That's where I, that, that's how I derive meaning from who I am in this world and what I've been able to do in this world. But by the time he writes Philippians, the reality is none of that's true anymore, and none of it really means that much to him, and it, it begs the question, well, why? I mean, was Paul, like, was he discouraged at this point in his life? Did, was he kind of like a, a nihilist, like nothing really matters? Was he fatalistic? Was he, had he given up? And nothing could be further from the truth. He was so passionate about one thing that everything else didn't really matter that much anymore. 
Here's how he says it. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Say, Paul, I thought you already knew him, but I, I, I need to know him more. That's what matters most. So over the past few weeks, you know, I've been kind of in a different rhythm uh, during this, this time of, of rest and prayer, and I've thought a lot, prayed a lot about what matters most. And as I look back the past 17 years since uh, Susie and I started the journey, uh, this, this church, um, church has mattered most to me in many ways at times. And I love what I get to do to serve you and to serve uh, what we call Journey City, our region. And just, uh, I look up to you, admire you, you're my heroes. And I love being a part of this. Most, it's the most fulfilling and challenging thing I could imagine doing with my life. But I'm realizing more and more, and church, by the way, matters more to me than it ever has in some ways. I think it's gonna matter more in our world. You know, Jesus did not say, upon this rock, I will build a political platform and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He, he said, I'm gonna build a church, like not, not like a building, not an organization, a living, breathing, thriving community of believers who worship me as king and the gates of hell don't stand a chance against that. And so I believe church matters more than ever, but it does not matter most. I've had moments where I thought, you know, my family matters most to me, especially when I look at seasons of my life when I, I didn't, I wasn't the husband and dad that I could have been. I'm very grateful by God's grace that I don't have any big regrets, but I do have some small ones, just moments I, I just wasn't dialed in enough. I was too busy, but I'm realizing man, my family matters more to me than it ever has. I'm more in love with Susie than I have ever been. She's amazing. Yeah, thank you, the four of you that find that romantic. I mean, it's just, love my kids, only season of life, their stage of life. I love them. I'm so committed to learning this new chapter of fatherhood. Family matters more to me than it ever has, but it does not matter most. My own emotional and, and mental health, I've been realizing over the past few years, matters more than I could ever imagine. I've done a lot of work there by God's grace and matters so much, but it does not matter most. And that's what Paul's saying. It's what I continue to learn. And you may not buy it yet, again, and that's okay. But more and more, I'm with Paul. Knowing Jesus matters most. And I think some of us would, would say, well, so you're saying it's, it should be one of our priorities. How many of us have priorities? How many of us would say we have some priorities? Okay, so a little bit of a trick question. We talk that way, but none of us have priorities. It's impossible to have priorities. The word priority means, by its very definition, there aren't any others. You can only have a priority. Then you can have lots of other things that matter, but they really only start to matter by their relationship to your priority. That's why you see as people live, over time, their real priority emerges. Nobody has priorities over the long term. They just have a priority. Some people, it's their job. Some people, it's their money. Some people, it's a relationship. Some people, it's, a, it's their influence. And Paul says, you know, I realize I don't have priorities. I thought I did. Now I have a priority. His name is Jesus. And if that's true, that knowing him matters most, then whatever else we're worried about right now doesn't matter most. Whatever resentment we're carrying around doesn't matter most. What's going on in our world and our opinion about it doesn't matter most, no matter what we post. <laughs> that doesn't just rhyme, it's true, if you think about it. And interestingly enough, what Paul discovered toward the end of his life is knowing Jesus matters most and the only way anything else will matter over the long term my family, my church life, my, my job, my finances, my mental health, my friendships, my, the, the happiness I experience in this world. The only way for any of that to matter is when Jesus and knowing him matters most. And the only hope for our world is when Jesus matters most. Knowing Jesus matters most. I don't have priorities. I have a priority. And everything else in my life looks to that to decide how important it is. That's what Paul's saying. Now, 
I know some of us may be thinking, ooh, whew, that's a little extreme. I don't know, you just went on this sabbatical, whatever that is, dude. Like, uh, you're all fired up. I'll give you a few weeks. And, you know, get this worked out. It's a little, like, <laughs> intense. And I feel you. Jesus is kind of extreme. He really is. I'm realizing more and more. He's way more extreme than I thought he was. But not in the way we think of extreme. See, when we think extreme, we think of like leaders in this world who get up and make very passionate, fiery speeches and tell you why everybody else is wrong and they're right and you should listen to them. And that's what we think is extreme. That's not extreme. Jesus is way more extreme than that. Jesus is so extreme that he just knows he's the king. He refuses to compete. He refuses to compete for our attention. So Jesus isn't like, oh, you know, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. That's, that's no. Jesus is like, I'm the king. And so what that means is as long as we are caught up in a quest for worldly validation, so where our job life is our priority or our college life or our social life or our money life or our sex life or our travel life or our relationship life or our fun life or our hobby life, whatever it is, nothing wrong with some of those lives for sure. But as long as we're caught up in that's who I am and that's how I validate myself, Jesus steps back. He's not going to bug you every two seconds like, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? What are you doing now? He just steps back and he lets you chase your unworthy king. Until you and I come to the place like Paul did where we realize, wait a minute, I'm chasing all these things and some of them are good things, but none of them matter most. I need a new king. That's where Paul, that's when Paul met Jesus, he realized, oh, I have had the wrong king. I need a new king. Listen to this next part. He says, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Now, does that mean that Paul threw away all of the relationships, anything he enjoyed, laughter, learning, meaningful work, serving others? No, you look at his life. He lived a very, very full life. Right up until the end of his life, he was making a difference. They put him in prison and he wouldn't stop writing letters to churches that we still read today. What it means is he threw away all attempts to find his identity and his worth in anything in this world. And he put his focus on Jesus. So during uh, this sabbatical time, uh, we traveled some, but when we got home, I get to spend some more time around our dog. And we have the world's greatest dog. I know you think your dog is great, but ours is better. I'm just saying ours is better. <laughs> And some of you know my story. I did not want a dog. I was not a dog person, and I'm still not. I don't care about your dog. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> my daughter asked, my, my daughter asked for 11 years for a dog. She started when she was like three. Finally created a, a whole slide presentation on why we should get a dog, and that got me. But our dog has a, has a bad habit. How many of us have a pet with a bad habit? How many of us have a parent with a bad habit? It's another series for another time. We'll, do, we'll, t we'll dive into that. But. So we, whenever we take our dog for a walk, we get, we get a few hundred feet from the house, not close anymore, and she poops. Now, some of you are going, why would you even bring that up in church? It's disgusting. <laughs> Others of you are going... Because your dog people, that guy up there gets me. He gets my life. <laughs> and uh, we have to stop and pick it up and put it in a little bag. Now, this is not poop. Don't. F <laughs> I know my boundaries, okay? <laughs> we have to clean it up. Can I just tell you, at that moment, I don't love my dog. And the walk is ruined for me. Because I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes walking around the neighborhood like, that you wish you were me. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Well, believe it or not, I'm not just trying to be crude. Paul wrote Philippians in the Greek language. 
And the word he uses when he says, compared to knowing Jesus, everything else in my life, I consider it garbage. That word garbage doesn't mean just garbage. That word was most commonly used in the first century for poop. (laughs) Paul's saying, I realized that I had gone through life holding up things that I thought proved I was somebody. I was posting about it. <laughs> I, was, I was bragging about it. I was like, look it, just got my degree. Just got my new car. You didn't have a car as the first century. Just got my new sandals. <laughs> just, oh, just look at here's me hanging out with one of the most influential people. And he said, I spent my life Going, it's my, it's my job, it's my education, it's my money, it's my influence, it's my appearance, all these things that I thought validated me. And then I had this awakening and I saw Jesus for who he is. And I realized I spent my whole life taking pride in things. You say, are you? And some of you are offended right now. And Paul knew you would be. He knew his readers, they would bristle at this. You're saying, are all those things in my life, you mean they're just like, they're just, Boop. No, I'm saying all those things in your life are that compared to Jesus. The gap between the fulfillment and the reality of knowing Jesus and anything else in this world is so great that Paul realized it's a waste to have any other king. It's a waste because knowing Jesus matters most. I don't have priorities. I have a priority. And that's the culture of God's kingdom. And that's what baptism is, by the way. It is washing off every other source of validation and anxiety and keeping up. Can I just speak a word over somebody today? When you go down into that water by faith in Jesus, you stop trying to keep up with the world. You become who you really are in Christ. And you no longer walk around with this constant pressure to compete because you've decided that Jesus will never have to compete. He is Lord of your life. Baptism is publicly declaring Jesus is the king. Here's how Paul describes it. He says, I no longer count on the old stuff, my own righteousness, my sense of superiority, the side I'm on politically, the the ambitions I have, the influence I have in this world. I don't count on that anymore. I don't count on my own sense of justice, obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous and whole and fulfilled and complete through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. What matters most knowing Jesus, and that comes through faith in Jesus. Not just saying, well, I believe in Jesus as one of many priorities in my life. No, it is saying, I am willing to burn the ships and bet the farm to put faith in my king. He's king of my life. Some of us are gonna be picking colleges this fall, and that can be very stressful. And it could overwhelm you with anxiety if what college you get into matters most. Some of us are trying to get past a relationship that ended and we can't fix it and we feel like our lives are over. That's only true if that person was your king. Some of us are, are, we don't feel as sharp as we used to. We see younger people, more attractive people, more talented people kind of taking our place and it's discouraging if staying relevant and attractive by this world's standards is your king. Some of us are are dealing with a serious illness, and it matters, and I by no means would I make light of that. I know some of your stories. This isn't just a random illustration. And the degree to which that diagnosis consumes our minds depends on what or who matters most. And I'm not saying this for you, okay? I'm just saying it for me. You can listen in. But I am learning that I am anxious and worried and preoccupied to the degree that I am giving my allegiance to someone or something who isn't qualified to be my 
king. You say, well, it's not like I'm bowing down to them. What have you thought about most over the past 24 hours? I don't worship money. What have you thought about most over the past 24 hours? I'm not obsessed with how this person thinks about me. What have you thought about most over the past 24 hours? Who's your king? And the good news is, if you're a follower of Jesus, he's your king, and he's got you. Who gets elected this fall, it matters. I'm not trying to make light of it. But it doesn't matter most. And by the way, when you make Jesus king of your life, you don't just get four years. Like, he's not up again in four years. Like, who are we going to pick now? No. In fact, you don't even vote Jesus in. He's already in. You just acknowledge that he was always the king. That's how that works. You say, are you trying to make light of voting? That's really important. It is really important. Do it through the lens of who's already king. Jesus is king. That's what matters most. Well, I really got to keep this job at all costs. No, I know the job matters. You got to keep it. Got to pay those bills. But no, not at all costs. At all costs, you got to know Jesus. That's what matters most. Well, I don't know how to deal with this conflict I'm going through. I'm sure it's complicated. Just make sure knowing Jesus is the filter for the next thing you say and text and decide. Because that's what matters most. And that's the culture of the kingdom. Faith in Jesus and baptism is going public, not with our perfection, but with his, with our faith in Jesus, because knowing Jesus matters most. What about the details of my future? I don't know. And I get it that it matters, but not most. So know Jesus. That's what matters most. What about everything I'm trying to, I have all these racing thoughts. I've been there. Those racing thoughts are not what matters most about you. You know Jesus, and that matters most. See, those of us who put our faith in Jesus are not like people in this world who get caught up in external validation and measuring themselves by what they've done or have compared to other people. No, we are citizens of heaven. We belong to a different kingdom where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. So we belong to a different kingdom kingdom. And when you take the step of baptism, that's what you're saying. You're demonstrating your true citizenship. It's an oath of allegiance to Jesus. You're saying, I'm part of a kingdom that's beyond this world. And because of what the king has done for me, I am never the same. My life has been transformed and is being transformed. I have a king, which means I have all the rights. You know, the harder we fight for our rights in little petty ways in this world, like, how dare you? Why did you? I can't believe you cut me off. I can't believe you. Did you just get in line in front of me? I was supposed to get that promotion. The more we do that, the more anxious we get. But when we realize we have a king, I have all the rights and all the protection and all the security of having a worthy king. When you have a king, you don't walk around freaking out about what everybody else is freaking out about. While the world's going, oh no, what's going to happen? You go, oh no, I don't know, but I know this. I've got a king. And his kingdom will never end. And every, I don't have priorities. I just have a priority, knowing Jesus. It matters most. So let me ask you, is that what matters most in your life right now? And some of you, if you're honest, you would say, no, it isn't. And that's okay. Again, I'm not here to twist your arm. Just come back. I think you owe it to yourself to see what your life could look like when you stopped having priorities and you met the priority. Just come back. But for some of you today, God's working on your heart right now, and you're like, oh man, I think, I think I'm like where Paul was, where he realized it doesn't matter how much money I make in the end. 
It doesn't matter how many degrees I get. It doesn't matter who likes my posts. It doesn't matter if, it doesn't even matter if they stay or leave. Matters, but not most. And if you've realized that, humbly, that brokenness you feel on the inside, listen to me very closely. Listen, that brokenness you feel on the inside is a gift. Jesus has stopped competing and he's stepping into your life and he's saying, hey, if you're ready to meet your king, I'm here. I, I'm actually worthy of bowing your life down to. And I'd love to save you and change you today. So we're gonna celebrate baptism together in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, I'm gonna invite all of us into one moment of prayer together. I'm gonna lead us. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's a great moment to be reminded of who your king really is. But if you wanna take that step today and put your faith in Jesus, this is your opportunity to trust him with your life. So let's all of us just open your heart up to God <clears throat> together. Oh, if you're online right now, just block out everything. And if that's you, you're here in the room, online, wherever you are, you would say, I wanna make Jesus king of my life. Whisper out a prayer of faith. You can use my words if it helps you, but something like this, pray with faith in your heart. Jesus, you are my king, and I surrender my life to you today. I believe you died to forgive my sins and that you rose again. Jesus, you're the only one worthy to be king of my life. So I give it all to you today. I'm yours. And if that's you, while well, everybody around you stays focused on God, if you would say, man, I want to be included in that. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. Would you lift your hand so I can see it? Just hold it up high and boldly if you're here in the room. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. Yes. Yes. Thank God. Yes. It's awesome. Thank God. Thank God. Online, you can type the word faith in the comments. and Let your host know you're taking that step. And then, Journey, would you help me? Let's give King Jesus all the praise. Can we do that together? Come on, let's give him all the praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. And then I'm going to invite you all over the room to stand with me. We're getting ready to celebrate baptism together, and it's going to be an amazing, amazing moment of reality. We think this world is our reality, but we're about to experience God's reality. And for all of you who've signed up in advance, in just a moment, um, we're gonna roll a, a video, a brief video. Worship team's gonna come back, lead us in worship. That's your cue. Just go to the, to the uh, baptism area outside the auditorium doors. Uh, for all of us who've already taken the step of baptism, I wanna encourage you, just soak this in. Celebrate with your brothers and sisters in Christ and be reminded who your king is. But I wanna take one more moment. If you're here today, and you put your faith in Jesus and you haven't taken the step of baptism yet for yourself, we'd love to help you take that step and you don't have to have signed up in advance. When we roll that video in just a moment, that's your cue. Just walk out of the auditorium right outside these doors. Our team is ready. We have everything you need. I always like to hold it up and prove that we got everything you need. We have towels to dry off with. We have the most stylish baptism shorts you have ever seen in your life. We got, we got shorts in all sizes and, and then we have, I'm wearing one, but we have, we want you to take that home and be reminded. You're not just never the same because you came to church. You're not just never the same because you went down briefly in water and came back up. You're never the same because King Jesus has transformed your life and you're not ashamed to go public with your faith. We're going to celebrate together and when we roll this video that's your cue go and our team is ready to help you take that step you ready journey let's party together and celebrate baptism here we go process a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end today we invite you to take a step into the water and begin the process of publicly putting an end to the burden of shame, guilt, to suffering, and to sin. An end to every name the enemy tried to put on you. As you take this step of faith, 
will celebrate with you a joy that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Go under and you'll come up renewed. You'll come up refreshed. You'll come up breathing in everlasting life, washed in the love of Jesus. So rejoice because you will never be the same.